Okay, uh, so what I will do is partly follow Renee's suggestion and not give you any definitions, but I'll talk a little bit about um, how response innovation might be done in practice. Um, oh, there, there. Uh, what I'll, I'll talk about two projects. Um, one is a, an EU-funded project which is specifically on response innovation, that's the Responsible Industry Project. And the other one is the Human Brain Project, which is a big ICT slash neuroscience project where I'm part of the RRI component. And uh, the idea here is for me to, to sort of um, surface some of the challenges that you face when you try to implement RRI in research in, um, in environments which are not identical to um, or, or not um, similar to, to what I think is typically the assumption behind response innovation. So my, my question is how to do it practically. And I think uh, in the literature on response innovation, you see um, at least implicitly often the assumption that uh, the research is publicly funded, that it takes place in clear structures of uh, research projects, and that there are straightforward ways of uh, governance of affecting what happens in those projects. Now, the two projects I'm talking about are um, both different uh, in different aspects of that. The Responsible Industry Project looks at the question of what would it mean to do research and innovation responsibly in industry. Uh, so the public funding falls out, and therefore also some of the, the mechanisms by which uh, research can be affected, can be steered, disappears. And of course, you have different motives for doing research, so the research structure may be uh, different. The Human Brain Project is, um, I think interesting in the sense that it's a huge project, it's very complex, it's very multidisciplinary, uh, it's also politically contested, um, and I think it raises lots of, of separate challenges uh, with regards to, to response to innovation. Uh, I'll briefly talk about these two projects and then I hope to come back to a few concluding remarks. So the response to industry project, um, what do we do? This is also a um, CSA. Uh, so it's not a research project, even though in, in practice, to me, it looks very much like a research project in, in many ways. What do we do? We start with an overview of what has been said about response innovation so far um, by looking at the literature. We've done 30 interviews. They are done, but they haven't been uh, analyzed, so we haven't seen the analysis yet. Um, we've done five bottom-up case studies, so there was a call, an open call to anybody who was interested um, to provide us with case studies of response innovation in industry. And we're doing, or we will be doing, two horizon scanning reports. Um, the, the idea here is that we want to use this to find out where along the value chain in industry are places where responsible industry, uh, innovation might be relevant, where it could be implemented. Um, and partly in order to find this out, we're doing a, a Delphi study. Uh, the, the first round of the Delphi study has been done, and I'll present you some of the uh, results of that later. The second round is currently on the way uh, where we're going back to the, the experts to explore what they think about um, the other answers from the first round. What are this, this supposed to be leading to is something that we've called an implementation plan for response innovation. Um, and all those different activities, the lit review, the case studies, the interviews, the Delphi study, all of this is supposed to inform this implementation plan, which is something we hope we can give to companies, and uh, those companies can then do something which will help them to be um, responsible in their innovation. We will then, once we have this implementation plan, we'll do a set of focus groups and we'll do a set of case studies. So Emad over there is going to be uh, in charge of doing a lot of the case study work. Um, this will help us to refine the implementation plan, and then once we've done all this, we will present what we've called an exemplar implementation plan. At the moment, we're at the stage where we're trying to figure out what this implementation plan is going to look like. Uh, so if any of you want to ask me what it looks like, I can't tell you. Uh, if any of you have any good suggestions of what it should look like, please talk to me. So I, I'll briefly talk, to, uh, talk you through some of the results of the first round of the Delphi study, uh, which hopefully will give you some insights in, um, into what people think about responsible innovation in industry might look like. So these are our respondents. We had an overall of, I think, 163 or so people responding. Um, and we wanted to focus on industry. As you can see, we, st we have about a quarter of our respondents from industry. We have uh, the majority from research. Well, researchers are easy to, to get to talk. Uh, we have some policy, and we have a set of users in there as well. 
By the way, I, sh I should say that uh, in order to ha keep this manageable, the Response Ministry project focuses on the technology of ICT. So we, we thought um, if we, we can't leave it completely open, so we have to focus on something to, to make it manageable. So we're looking at ICT, and we're looking at the grand challenge of health, demographic change, and well-being. So this is um, what we're interested in. We will, at the end of the project, look back and see whether that uh, allows generalization beyond, beyond that particular technology and application area. Uh, so we've asked people in the first round of the Delphi study, which was fundamentally an, an online survey, uh, what do they think are key issues or key technologies people should worry about. So um, the, the technologies you see here uh, come from the AAL, so the Ambient Assisted Living Community. These are technologies that have been identified as key enablers for ICT for health and um, demographic change and well-being. And we asked them, what, which ones uh, should we worry about? And you see that, that all of them have, so, so there's no zero there. Uh, nobody said any of them is completely um, uh, something we, we really don't need to worry about. Uh, but there are significant differences in terms of which ones we, we should worry about. And you see that the, the reasoning systems here on the right is something that um, had the highest uh, score. So this is something where people said, yeah, that's really important. Whereas others, such as human-robot uh, interaction on the other side, seems to be uh, less of a concern. Um, in terms of um, response motivation. We asked the respondents at what stage of the product de development life cycle um, response motivation should come in. And you can see that uh, the, the answer on the very right and the answer on the very left are, are the biggest ones. So the, the one on the very left is early planning. So at the beginning, when you start to plan your project, you should worry about response motivation. Somewhat contradictory to that, uh, we have the answer well, anywhere, along the entire value chain, from the, the first step to um, bringing it out to market and possibly post-market introduction. Uh, interestingly, the, the, coming back to basic research, we've already heard a lot about today, basic research seems to be something that um, our respondents didn't think uh, is the, the most important place to, to place um, response innovation. Who should be responsible? So which departments within the company should worry about response innovation? Um, and you see that the, uh, the, the biggest number of answers went to management, and that's general management, so, so the overall company, the, the, the top level uh, who, who are running the, the place. Uh, research and development, not very surprisingly, should worry about responsible innovation. And uh, CSR is also an area, so if they have a CSR department, corporate social responsibility, this is something where the respondents think responsible innovation should be located. Interestingly, not um, high on the agenda seem to be things like marketing and sales, um, where arguably um, some of the, the potential issues are generated, but our respondents didn't think that was um, very important. We asked them, what do you think are tools which could be used to implement response innovation? And you, you see the selection here. The, um, the, the biggest number is codes of conduct and principles. So, so they, they, this, uh, our respondents, 70% almost of them thought that having codes of conduct um, is a suitable mechanism that will allow industry to, uh, to engage with these questions. How should this be done? So, so, so what governance framework, what, what level of um, compliance should be necessary? Um, and uh, you, you, you see that the, the biggest one on the right is um, the reviewed by ethics committee. So the idea is that you have some sort of uh, internal um, or possibly external body, but that's not a, um, a, a policy body, so it's, it's not a regulator uh, that should review what's being done. Um, but the second one, quite surprisingly, uh, said that we need regulatory mechanisms that are evaluated through some sort of audit procedures. And voluntary, so something like uh, leave us alone, don't regulate us, um, only comes at third place. And the last question I, I want to present you here is, um, so why should we do this? Now, what, what are the benefits? Why would industry, how could we uh, make a case to somebody from industry that this is something that should be doing then? And if you look at the, the, the two winners here, um, it's the improved matching of ICT projects with societal needs. Oh, um, which is very much, I think, along the lines of desirability, uh, and also the, the high acceptability of ICT projects. And then here on the very right, 
which I find uh, somewhat surprising, is the benefit for humankind. So, so very abstract, large um, goal, well, this is going to make the world a better, better place. Much lower down on the agenda seem to be things like this leads to better market penetration, this is going to improve our corporate image. So I, I must say I, I, uh, I was a bit surprised by um, these responses. I would have expected the, the market penetration and the image to be much higher ranked. Um, I think, yeah, that's, that's my last uh, slide on, on the responsible industry projects. What we're now doing with this, as I said, we're trying to uh, develop the, um, the implementation plan. And uh, in May, we, we are going to have a meeting, a stakeholder meeting in Karlsruhe, where we are going to um, discuss the implementation plan with various people. So if any of you are interested in being part of that, please let me know. Um, I think we still have space to invite additional people. Um, th there are lots of other things coming out of the, the, the project. As I said, uh, many of them are still under development or being in analysis, so this is very much a pro uh, work in progress. Um, and I'll stop here with this project, which, as I said, looks at industry, which I think is an interesting case for responsible innovation uh, because the incentive structure and the governance structure is different from the typical university-based research projects. Now, the second project I want to talk about is the Human Brain Project. Um, and this is something that many of you will have heard. It's one of the two flagship European projects, uh, flagship ICT projects, um, which are supposed to be funded over 10 years to the area of about a billion euros. That's what they said at some point. It's probably going to be less. But it's a, it's a very big project. And the idea is that this is going to develop ICT tools to better understand the human brain. I think uh, that, that's sort of the strap line I would use now. At the beginning, when they started to develop the, the, the project, uh, there was a strap line, we are going to simulate a human brain in 10 years. And I think we've sort of moved away from that. Uh, that seems a bit unrealistic. Um, but the interesting thing about the Human Brain Project is, uh, from the perspective of this panel, is that it has a, a society and ethics sub-project um, where things around responsible innovation are anchored and where, where the locus of responsible innovation is. This society and ethics sub-project is uh, broken down into five substantive work packages. There's also a sixth one, which is a management one, where we do different things, and I think you will probably recognize the ideas of responsible innovation in here. So the first one, first uh, work package, uh, looks at foresight, and Michael over there is um, part of the team at King's College in London who do this. Uh, the second one is conceptual and philosophical activities, where we have uh, philosophers uh, under the leadership of um, Katinka What's the last name? Evers uh, from, uh, from Sweden. The third one is public dialogue and engagement, um, which is run or led by Jean-Pierre Changeux and is um, also supported by the, the people from the Danish Board of Technology, Lars Kluver and his team. 12.4 is research awareness. That's the one I lead. Um, and that's uh, a project, or it's a work package where we try to get the people within the project to reflect on what they're doing. So initially it was called reflexivity, but apparently neuroscientists couldn't deal with the term reflexivity, so we called it researcher awareness, which I think they can't deal with either. Um, but there you go. And the, the, the final one is uh, governance and regulation. This is where we have a research ethics committee and where we have an ethical legal social aspects committee. These are independent bodies um, linked to the, the, the Human Brain Project, which uh, sort of review the conduct of the research as well as strategic development. Now, that we've also just had our first uh, review about four weeks ago in Brussels, um, and uh, what I will present is sort of uh, insights from, from our work package, so, so the research awareness uh, work package, and I'll come back to some larger questions later on. So what have we done in research awareness? Uh, the, ideas, the idea was we need to understand what people within the project think um, about the, their role in the project, but also about the social and ethical aspects. So we interviewed all, or we interviewed directors from all of the sub-projects. So this has uh, 12 sub-projects overall at the moment. Um, so we interviewed directors from all of those, and in several cases we interviewed uh, more than one where they're available, uh, to find out what they think the project is doing, what the problems are that need to be addressed. We then consulted within our sub-project and with the external stakeholders and wrote a um, report, which at this point I think is on the, the HPP website. And at the moment, on the basis of our initial understanding, we're doing a survey of everybody who is linked with the um, Human Brain Project. 
Now, this led to the identification of tons of possible relevant ethical issues. Um, some of them are uh, very obvious and, and were clear from the, the get-go. Um, and the biggest one of that is probably privacy. Now, questions about data protection of uh, biomedical data that will be used for, um, as the baseline for, for the simulation. There are other lots of um, important questions, for example, things around um, dual use. So the EU doesn't want to fund military research, but this is the sort of research that the military is highly interested in. Um, how do we deal with the question of um, what, is, what is going to be used for, question of misuse, um, and lots of other ones. I, I will talk about two um, um, examples that I think are probably um, not as immediately obvious as, as ethical issues. One is, has to do with the question of multidisciplinary collaboration. So the Human Brain Project, while it sounds like a neuroscience project and lots of neuroscientists probably think it is a neuroscience project, actually is an ICT project. So it's funded under ICT in FP7 and will be in, in Horizon 2020, uh, which means that in practice you have at least three different types of um, scholars in there. You have neuroscientists, you have um, medical scholars, um, psychiatrists, and you have computer scientists. And on top of that, you also have people like, like us, that you have social scientists and philosophers and anybody else um, who, who can get in there. This raises uh, a lot of interesting uh, questions around um, collaboration and, and interdisciplinarity. And interestingly, the, the biggest schism there, this is the one that's referred to in the, these are two quotes from the interviews. Uh, the, the, the quote on the left, where we talk about the epistemological schism, that's actually within neuroscience. So even the neuroscientists yeah, don't agree on, on exactly what they're doing, um, which raises significant problems about the question, how can we do research? What does it mean to do research? What are the outcomes? Um, and then, on top of that, what are ethical issues related to that? And we see here that there is uh, the, the, the quote on the right. Uh, There's a metaphor of a telescope, which is one that came up several times. So, so the Human Brain Project is about observation. And the idea is that this will lead to transparency and, and therefore to responsibility. Everybody can see what everybody else is doing and therefore the, the research will be done uh, in an appropriate way. Uh, the other point I think is worth highlighting is the question of engagement with the future. So we all are aware of, of the dystopias of the Terminator, of Blade Runner. Um, and this is something that has been uh, played up very highly in, in the media uh, prior to the start of the project. And in the interviews, we asked uh, the, 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 the researchers, and these are top-level you know, uh, international researchers in computer science, neuroscience, and so on, how they deal with these questions, how, whether they, they want to engage with them, how they engage with them. And the general question, or the, the general gist of the answers is, well, we can't prove it's never going to happen, but really, it's not going to happen in the lifetime of this project. It's not going to happen in the next 10 years. It's far out beyond the horizon, and we don't want to deal with it. Um, and I think there are good reasons why they, they respond the way they do. You know, they, they want to be measured as scientists and, and uh, not as science fiction authors. Um, and I think there are issues around reputation um, that they want to avoid. But at the same time, uh, if the project actually ever manages to simulate significant parts of the human brain, then the question is, well, at what point would we have to worry about this? Which is something that the, the scientists are not particularly keen to engage with. I'll skip this and come to my, my last well, what I've called my concluding musings, because it's not really a conclusion in any strong sense. Um, but this now comes back to the question of RRI, uh, having looked at responsible innovation in industry, as well as responsible innovation in this very interdisciplinary inter international project of, uh, around the human brain. The question remains, what's new about it, if anything? Uh, what is it and uh, what, what's new about it? One interesting aspect that I got from the responsible industry project is that industry seems to be much uh, advanced when compared to universities with regards to taking the, a lot of the aspects of response innovation on board. So things like uh, engaging with broader audiences, uh, things like thinking about the future, uh, thinking about scenarios, about consequences of, of products. These are things that the industry people tell me, yeah, we do that. No, we've been doing this for years. We don't need to worry about this. Um, we've got it under control. Whereas universities, in my experience, don't do these things at all. Um, so, so I think that there, there remain interesting questions about um, what can responsible in innovation mean in industry. So how can it be implemented? Can it be implemented? Or is this possibly, uh, is, is it not a question of implementation? Is it a question of cultural change, of creating new myths rather than uh, implementations? And the last one is, is a very practical question that came partly out of the review of the Human Brain Project, uh, namely, how would we know it's actually happened? 
Now, how would we know it's successful? And we've had a debate within the Human Brain Project around uh, questions of, of impact, how would we measure impact, and, and last we were actually suggested impact measures from technology assessment, whether we could you know, use those. Um, and I think that, that also goes back to narratives. You know, at this point, we haven't got a strong narrative that would allow us to um, justify our existence as people doing responsive innovation. And that's partly to do with, um, in, if you talk to neuroscientists, they want quantitative measures. You know, they want to see something with a percentage on it. It's not good enough to say, well, we've talked to people and, and we've uh, raised awareness and, and, and created discourses. No, they're not interested. Uh, so how, how can, can we uh, deal with this sort of requirement or do we just say, no, that's not what we want to do? So that's on a project and a program level, but I think it's also a question on the societal level. And that may be the, the motivation for worrying about um, this on a policy level, why the Dutch presidency may not be interested in, um, in getting engaged too much into response innovation. Probably because we haven't got a strong answer to say, well, what would society look like if response innovation happened? And I think I'll stop here. Helge Torgesen from Vienna. If René is right, and responsible research and innovation is mainly about aligning innovation with the major tasks or major challenges of society beyond the market, then isn't that in contradiction to the main mode of operation of industry, namely profit? And yep. how can that be aligned? Well, the short answer is yes. That's the obvious contradiction. That's, I think, the reason why there was the call for the Responsible Industry Project, which was specifically aimed at industry, uh, because there, there clearly is the problem that a lot of the incentives and the governance mechanisms that um, Responsible Innovation looks at are irrelevant to industry. Um, and I think, well, I haven't got the answer, good answer to, to your question yet, but I, I think the, the project is meant to elaborate on this. But I think there are some aspects or some types of, of um, arguments you can put forward. So you can, on the one hand, you can put forward the uh, self-interest argument. So it's in the interest of industry to do this, um, and why would it be in the interest of industry to be responsible? Well, you can then look at functional advantages, better um, understanding of the market, better understanding of customers. Um, you can also look at, at the broader question of the, the societal um, permission to operate. Uh, so, so if industry does things that society uh, finds worrisome, then that may lead to problems. GMO uh, being an example. So, so that's, I think, one, one type of argument, why industry would in, be interested. Um, and another type of argument would be in the area of, of uh, corporate citizenship. Um, what, a, a company plays a part in the, um, in the social fabric, and in order to do that, it has to be sensitive to the, the, the needs and um, preferences of their stakeholders, and that includes questions around um, innovation. Whether this is something that industry will really buy into, I'll tell you in about two years. So thank you. I think it's also very uh, informative for us to have this uh, contrast of the two projects uh, that you show to us. And um, well, it leads, I think, to the hypothesis uh, that, that RRI is not disruptive for industry because they already start from the, well, from the inside that they have to be embedded in society in all kinds of ways, and maybe the, it's, it's, it's a shift, but not, maybe not a major shift, whereas it is really a disruption for universities and research institutes who have a sort of privileged position. And, um, well, in the same way as, as René von Sommer said, that they, they work on the idea that it's totally different than other policies and so on. Um, my question is about, about the work package that you showed, 12, which is about future medicine. You didn't talk about that, but it was... Uh, so what kind of reduction is there taking place? So that's 12.1, foresight? I, I think I can... Have foresight, no, but there are also, also in another uh, package. Yeah. So it seems to me that your RRI um, activities were reduced to only future medicine. Right. So, sorry, I should, should have... Is that the case? No, no, it's not. Oh. Um, so so the, the Human Brain Project has three major pillars. One is neuroscience, one is medicine, and one is computer science. And uh, the, the foresight group is doing foresight um, activities around all, all of these three. They've started with medicine, 
Um, and we'll now go on to the other ones. But m maybe Michael is in a better position to, to respond. Okay, so, so, so it is broader, okay. but... So then the question is maybe more open. Was that some kind of reduction in your experience to what you were allowed to, to work on? Because it seems no, that you are only no, no, thinking I, about medicine. But. No, I don't think there was a reduction in, in um, the way you framed it. Um, we were allowed to work on. Nobody's told us what we're allowed to do. Um, so, so the idea has always been that we, we are part of the, the research body of the project. Um, we are part of the consortium, so we're not independent of it. Uh, but we've always said that we have the academic freedom to research whatever we want, which is something that the, the, the scientists in the project are very comfortable with. Now, nobody there was trying to push us in a particular direction. Um, I think the, the, the bigger question um, is around uh, the outcomes and the acceptance of what we're doing in the rest of the consortium. So at this point, I think we're struggling with um, being relevant to the others. So we, we have um, organized big events around privacy where we got people from the medical informatics pillar um, and talked to them about what they're doing, how they're doing it. Um, then uh, we pr produced a, a policy brief on suggestion of what could be done in order to address privacy issues, which was, I think, generally well received, but whether that makes a difference, or whether that is actually taken on board, uh, implemented, is something I can't at this point tell you. My personal perception is that um, everybody in the Human Brain Project says, yes, yeah, it's good we have you, because we all realize there are ethical issues around this, um, but we haven't really worked out uh, the, the, the details of how this is going to make a difference. So we do things, but how they relate to and transmit into the rest of the, the consortium is still under development. Okay, as short as possible. The, um, on, on the industry element, uh, you know, what interests me, and I, I think what's new for me and for RRI is actually one where you hinted out to uh, the healthy aging uh, project. Uh, what is new there is that you can see there are public-private partnerships innovation partnerships uh, where you exactly extend beyond the normal market mechanisms to have a co stakeholder commitment on a societal desirable goal, namely uh, the objective is to um, to increase uh, our life expectancy with two years of quality of life, etc. So it's not termed in technological terms. Um, this contrasts in my view a little bit with the human brain project, because there you have, in fact, a technological objective, not a societal objective. It's purely, you know, we want to model the brain, and for a while it's good, uh, we don't know. Uh, of course, there could be an RRI uh, story behind it, a reflexity behind it, where it picks up. But my, my question to you is actually, because you did a lot of uh, investigation on industry, did you actually identify uh, in the industry uh, indeed such a commitment to work with stakeholders towards uh, not a technological objective but a societal objective uh, to get somewhere and use the technologies and means whatever it takes. I think there is a, a, a strong reliance on markets to achieve that. Um, so, so when we talk to people in industry um, the, the, the mechanism by which the innovation that they create will make a difference, will improve the life of the, the, the elderly, um, is going to be through markets. Um, so, so I think that, that re remains the case. However, um, the ICT for health and, um, and aging industry is a very specific industry, and I, I didn't, must admit I didn't realize that before we started the, uh, the, the project, in that they're highly regulated already anyway. Um, so, so they tend to uh, fall under the medical directive, uh, medical devices directive. Uh, they, they have to jump through all sorts of hoops, regulatory hoops in, in the national um, context. They used to work with ethics committees. They tend to have in-house ethics committees. So, so they have a whole gambit of stuff that we would um, place under the heading of responsible innovation. And that's why they say, yep, we're comfortable with that. Uh, but I think that there still is reliance on the market mechanism in the end uh, to make sure that whatever pr comes out of this is taken up by society and, and improves society. By the way, a, a quick response to the first point, namely that the Human Brain Project is a technology-driven one. That may be true, but it's certainly not part of the, the rhetoric. Uh, if you read any um, publications on, on the Human Brain Project, it's all about the immense burden of, uh, of mental illnesses, 
which is a, an immense financial burden, but of course it's also an immense burden on, on our individual lives. Uh, something like one third of all EU citizens are expected to have a mental illness over the course of the next 10 years. Um, so, so it's very much framed in terms of producing uh, or contributing to the, the public good. And the argument is that in order to be able to do that, we need to have insights into the human brain, which we cannot under any circumstances ever achieve through a traditional neuroscience mechanism. And that's why we need the, uh, the technical simulation of the brain. So, so uh, I think at least in terms of rhetoric, it is very much about the common good. Yeah, I'll try to be brief. Uh, thank you for a very uh, interesting presentation. My name is uh, Challing Swierstra. Um, if you're interested in an implementation strategy, you will also be interested in ident identifying barriers. And in my experience, one of those barriers is discursive in character or rhetorical in character, that there are rather persistent re discursive structures that seem to have as main function to avoid accountability or responsibility. And just to mention three that I saw happening on your slides, huh? there's the, the strategic use of the future. It's never too soon to talk about the benefits. It's always too soon to talk about the costs. Yeah. The other is the fact value split. Huh? Uh, as Ravid said, for instance, uh, science takes credit for penicillin and society gets blamed for the bomb. And there's the uh, basic and applied research. And if we don't articulate those discursive structures and bring them into a self-reflexive process, I'm afraid this whole responsible innovation will falter at exactly those barriers. Have you been giving any thought about that? Yes, I have, and I completely agree with you. Um, looking at those two projects, I think the interesting observation is that these discursive stru uh, structures are very clear in the Human Brain Project, where you have uh, world-leading neuroscientists, computer scientists, uh, which are completely immersed in this sort of discourse. Um, and there's a lot less of this um, in, in industry. So, so the, the scientists are many of them at least, are very comfortable with the, the distinction between fundamental and, and applied science and say, I, I do fundamental research, so therefore I don't need to worry. Uh, I don't worry, need to worry about the future because we can't predict it. And of course, they, uh, it's easy to say that there are contradictions because they have to predict the future when they write a proposal, but as you said, it's only the positive future, it's never, never the downside. Um, but in industry, that's much less the case. In industry, uh, I think questions of accountability um, are probably much further thought through than they are in universities, and possibly because universities are very nice and sheltered uh, universe that you know, doesn't have to necessarily interact with the rest of the world.